for this panel, Building Bridges Across Sectors, How to Build Lasting Partnerships Between Hospitals and Street Homeless Outreach, we will have a brief overview of the intersection between health, homelessness, and racial disparities, and we will talk about the critical need for these health and housing partnerships. And then we will hear from our panelists who will focus on the following themes, using data to inform programming and to address health and racial disparities, challenges and opportunities during the COVID-19 crisis, and how to build and sustain these partnerships. Next slide. So as you can see, uh, a poll just showed up, so we wanted to kick it off. So for each of these statements, let us know, um, in your opinion, if they're true or false. So we'll give everybody a minute there to fill out the poll. So the first is hospitals will keep a homeless patient up to eight days longer than their house counterparts, incurring millions of dollars in additional cost. 75% of homeless patients return to the emergency department within two weeks of discharge. And homeless adults die at a rate four to five times greater than would be expected in the general population. Give it a few more seconds. Great. <clears throat> so uh, you guys should be able to see the poll. So, you know, mostly people got it right. You know, unfortunately, all of these statements are true. Um, so looking at these facts alone, it helps us understand the intimate link between health and housing and why these partnerships are critical and not only improving the health of people who are experiencing homelessness, but ultimately getting them access to permanent, safe and quality housing. Next slide. So this slide is not, you know, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's not new to most people. Uh, but in reality, uh, just over the last few years, has the healthcare system really started to look at the link between health and housing and started to coin the term social determinants of health. Just so we're all on the same page, um, CDC defines social determinants of health as conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. Some examples include food insecurity, isolation, lack of housing, and other factors. There is an abundance of research um, on this, and I'm sure you all have plenty of examples from your own work showing how a person's life experiences and environment affects health more than the quality or quantity of health care they receive. So unsurprisingly, this is especially true for people who've experienced or are currently experiencing homelessness. As you can see on the slide, people who are undomiciled or homeless have three to four times higher rate of mortality than those who are housed, they also have higher rates of chronic conditions like hypertension, heart failure, diabetes, and asthma. And lastly, research shows that people who are experiencing homelessness show geriatric symptoms at least 15 to 20 years before a domiciled population. So really when we start to look at kind of the aging population in, um, when it comes to those who are homeless, they tend to look older, right? Much before. So a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the programs and things that they would qualify for when they, let's say, turn 62, they really need them at 55 um, or even earlier than that. So that's another key thing to think about when we're looking at this population that they are definitely um, sicker and have more geriatric symptoms. Next slide. So we all, you know, definitely know by now the link between health and housing, but we cannot overlook the disparities in both homeless systems and other public health systems and in healthcare overall. So in April of this year, CSH released a new tool to highlight racial disparities across multiple public systems. So we call this tool the RDDI, or the Racial Disparities and Disproportionality Index. And what it does, it looks at 17 unique systems and measures whether racial and or ethnic group representation in a particular system is proportionate to 
over or below their representation the overall population. So this is what we refer to as the proportionality part of the tool. And it also allows for the examination of systemic differences between groups and geographies, or what we call the disparities. This particular graph that you see here is taken from our RDDI tool, which if you guys are interested, uh, you can go to the CSH website and take a look at this tool and play around with it. It's actually um, on Tableau, so you have access to use um, any function of the tool. And what this tool focus, what this uh, graph focuses on is New York. Um, as you can see, black populations have the highest index scores, followed by American Indian or Alaska Native, and then Hispanic and Latinos have the third highest index scores. And specifically for um, Hispanics and Latinx, uh, this may be um, undercounted, uh, recognizing that we have a large uh, population of undocumented people in New York. This data is not only important or nice to know, but it should absolutely inform programming and policies we have in these systems and ensure that these disparities are addressed. Next slide. Again, for years on end, we've seen significant health disparities among Black, Indigenous, people of color, or BIPOC in healthcare. Last year, CSH partnered with the Healthcare for the Homeless Council to look at health disparities among BIPOC folks. As you can see from this chart, the disparities are especially pronounced in, uh, in rates of chronic disease and disease mortality rates among people of color, particularly for people who are Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, and Hispanic or Latinx. Again, this data is not just nice to have, but it's absolutely critical in what we do with it um, in order to really address these disparities. Next slide. So another quick poll. Um, you know, given that this is the bridging the gap between hospitals and street outreach, um, if you can choose an answer from the poll question. So on January 27, 2020, during the HOPE count, which is the Homeless Outreach Population Estimate facilitated by DHS, how many unsheltered people were found on the street or subways? So between 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 3,000, or over 3,000? So we'll give everybody a minute or so. So you guys are, are pretty on top of what's going on in New York City around business. So yeah, over 3,000 people um, were found on the streets or subways. Um, what, you know, what we also think is if they're not, a, they're not in the shelter, right, or they're not on the street or subways, where else can they be found? Next slide. Well, as many of us know, they are usually in emergency rooms across New York City. Um, recognizing this very smartly, the Health and Housing Consortium was really thinking about how to collect this data. And since 2014, they've been doing what's called the Hospital Homeless Count. So for this year, the consortium team and hospitals identify an additional 226 unsheltered homeless New Yorkers in the emergency room just in that one night. This information is very valuable um, because, you know, we're missing an opportunity to engage with these individuals that probably spend more time in the emergency room and in inpatient settings than, than they are on the street or in a shelter. So it leaves an opportunity for really that healthcare and homeless outreach team to start partnering to really identify these folks and not just, you know, help them with their healthcare needs, but really to, to um, engage them around their housing needs that they, that they desperately have. Next slide. So with that brief overview, um, I wanted to introduce our wonderful panelists. Uh, so the first person that I'm introducing, uh, Huang Rivera, he is the program director for Bronx Works Homeless Outreach Team and a proud lifelong Bronx Knight. He has been at Bronx Works for 13 years in several capacities, including outreach worker, case manager, and outreach coordinator. He has 20 years of homeless outreach experience working in four of the five New York City boroughs and organization, organizations such as Partnership for the Homeless. 
Casey Burke, who is a licensed uh, Masters of Social Worker, is the program director for Breaking Ground Street to Home Program and Williamsburg Stabilization Bed Program, overseeing a wide range of services for people experiencing homelessness in Brooklyn. She began working with Breaking Ground Street to Home Program in 2007 and has been serving as program director since 2013. Casey's social work practice has focused on people living with HIV and AIDS, people living with severe mental illness, and primarily people living on the streets and in supportive housing. Shane Cox serves as the Interim Assistant Commissioner of Partnerships, Capacity Building and Strategy in the Street Homeless Solutions Unit at New York City Department of Homelessness. He has the longest title here, so he's really important. Uh, Shane began his social services career as a Child Protective Specialist with ACS in 2002 and joined the DHS Street Homeless Solutions Unit in 2016. Shane currently provides oversight of street outreach programs initiative with partner agencies and works to further develop specialized settings designed to help to help unsheltered New Yorkers rebuild their lives. And finally, um, uh, Dr. Lan is a primary care physician at New York City Health and Hospitals, Bellevue. She co-founded the Bellevue Primary Care Safety Net Clinic, which is an intensive outpatient team that draws expertise from different parts of public hospital systems and CBOs to work together on social work, care coordination, housing navigation, and medical care for those dealing with homelessness and complicated biopsychosocial issues. She is interested in exploring effective collaborations that can directly disrupt the poverty cycles for homelessness, for homeless New Yorkers living with medical and mental health complications. So now we'll hand it off to each of these panelists and they'll give a uh, so, you know, brief talk on their work and then we will head into the moderate discussion later on. Thank you. Next slide. All right, can everyone hear me? Yep, you're good. All right, thank you. <laughs> so Patricia, thank you for the intro and uh, hello to everybody joining in today. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Bronx Works. Uh, first, let me read our mission statement. Bronx Works helps individuals and families improve their economic and social well-being. From toddlers to seniors, we feed, shelter, teach, and support our neighbors to build a stronger community. Below the mission statement, I listed some of the services Bronx Works offers, which of course includes homeless services. On the right, I wanted to highlight the continuum of care that we offer in our homeless services department, which includes our 24-hour outreach team and drop-in center, three safe havens, and a men's mental health shelter. Uh, we also have three permanent housing programs, two are supportive housing programs, and we have a scattered site program as well. Um, having this continuum of care is really beneficial to our team and the individuals we work with. Many clients have gone through this continuum from start to finish and are now permanently housed. Next slide, please. All right, so why is it important for us as an outreach provider to build relationships with hospitals? Uh, let's, let's look at some of those numbers, right? So on the left are the results of this year's HOPE count, which does not include individuals who may be using hospitals as shelters. Uh, the number of individuals counted on the street this year in the Bronx was 231. Uh, on the right are numbers from this year's HHC hospital homeless count. And you can see that in the Bronx, <clears throat> there were a total of 104 individuals counted. That's almost half the amount of folks that were counted on the street. So clearly we know there's a, another population that exists within hospitals that our teams definitely need to address. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so our work with hospitals really uh, goes back several years, but it really expanded in 2015, 2016, uh, when we collaborated with St. Barnabas um, during the MAC series. Uh, the MAC series grew out of DISRIP, which was a New York State Department of Health initiative created to lower costs, create better care, and improve health. Uh, to receive DISRIP funds, hospitals were asked to partner with other agencies, including community-based organizations, and Bronx Works quickly partnered with St. Barnabas. Uh, one of the focuses of the MAC series was super utilizers with frequent ED or inpatient stays. And in our collaboration with St. Barnabas, we, we broke it down into a 50 individual uh, cohort of super util utilizers. And we discovered that 36 of the 50 had a history of homelessness. Um, we then identified 15 of those 36 that were known to Bronx Works 
and focused our interventions on them, and the results were, were extremely impactful. Uh, for example, we had one individual that we worked with who um, had a total of 184 ED visits in 2016, and after being placed in safe haven, uh, his ED visits dropped to just 23 in 2017. Um, the MAC series eventually ended, but the work had been successful and we wanted to keep it going. And this is where you know, the idea was kind of born to have housing navigators embedded in the EDs, working as an extension of the outreach team. And we've done that at St. Barnabas, at Bronx Care, and at Lincoln Hospital. Next slide, please. All right, so here are just a little bit of uh, the results of the work on the social service side and, and the financial part of it as well. Uh, you can see that, you know, in the last couple of years with these ED programs, we've engaged uh, close to 2,000 individuals, uh, you know, close to 1,300 of which were new to us. Uh, we've placed 53 people in transitional housing. We've had uh, 20 2010 Es, uh, four housing interviews. We placed someone in permanent housing. Um, you know, all great uh, statistics and, and great work that's been done over the last few years at the three hospitals. Um, on the right here, just to give you a sense of, you know, the utilization in the ED, uh, this is one hospital uh, with six patients that were tracked three months prior to placement in transitional housing. You can see that the utilization of the ED and the inpatient and clinic services ran up a bill of about $340,000. Um, three months after placement, those same six patients uh, only totaled $23,000 in services. So a huge drop, $315,000. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's a little bit more of the same, just at a different hospital. Uh, here we looked at eight clients uh, pre and post placement uh, into transitional housing. Uh, pre placement, 253 ED visits, post placement, 87. Uh, patient uh, visits also dropped. You know, we had 37 pre-placement and 12 post-placement. So huge reductions there. And then financially, uh, it, it was about $235,000. Uh, so huge impacts, um, you know, both on the financial side and, and just, you know, the health side for the clients. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so, so to wrap up here, uh, I have some takeaways uh, from our work. Uh, basically incorporating ED canvassing as part of your everyday operations. You know, our teams visit uh, a particular ED on every shift, every day, uh, making sure to engage hospital staff. It doesn't matter who they are, whether it's the security guard, the janitor, whoever. Um, they're all valuable folks to talk to. They have information. They know what goes on in their hospitals. Um, and we can also share information with them. Um, being transparent about what outreach can and can't do. Um, you know, I think sometimes hospitals think we can swoop in and just house someone the very next day. Um, it doesn't happen that way. We have to make sure we don't overpromise um, and that we have clear expectations. Uh, the hospital coordinator position is something that I can get into a little bit more later, but I think it's, it's a huge position in terms of laying the foundation uh, to building those relationships with hospitals. And, and it's a position we've had um, as part of our program probably for the past decade. Um, presentations and tours with hospitals are very effective. I mean, we did that during the MAC series with St. Barnabas. Uh, it helped the staff there kind of lay their eyes on, on the drop-in and the safe haven and get a sense for, for where they were referring their clients. Um, High-level meetings with hospital administrators provide deeper understanding. You know, those meetings are important so that you understand, you know, workflow and, and limitations and culture and kind of where, how you can work together, what are the short-term goals, long-term goals. Um, and, you know, those meetings, it, that's where the ideas kind of happen and, and those ideas can move forward slowly if, if you build that relationship and you continue to work on it. It's an ongoing thing um, so that you can, you know, sort of pounce on the opportunities such as the Mac series uh, when they come up. Um, but ultimately, you know, funding is, is the big question, right? Um, you know, we, our program at Bronx Care, unfortunately, ended last year. Uh, St. Barnabas is likely to end this year for us as well. Um, <clears throat> and we may suffer the same fate at Lincoln. Um, so, you know, these programs are proven, they're effective, they make a big difference. Uh, they address a population that kind of falls through the cracks. Um, so, you know, the question is, uh, you know, who's going to pay for that work to continue? Um, because otherwise you're going to have just a, a, a big sort of deficit in terms of service uh, for these clients. And that's all I have. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Casey Burke. I am uh, the program director for Breaking Ground Street to Home and also overseeing the new Williamsburg Stabilization Bed program in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, next slide, please. So at Breaking Ground, uh, we are the largest supportive housing provider in, uh, in New York. We have, I think, at the end of my a slide there, it says 19 buildings, and I think at this point we're up to 21 or 22. Um, we provide 24-7 outreach in Brooklyn, Queens, and Midtown Manhattan as part of the Manhattan Outreach Consortium. We also have a drop-in center in um, Ozone Park, Queens, that is serving 10 uh, clients right now, but they are working to build out um, to a drop-in center that can house 75 folks, as well as a safe haven program. It says 2019, but obviously that <laughs> construction has been delayed, um, and they hope for 2021. Um, and then we have um, three safe havens, uh, one in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, one in um, on the Bowery in Manhattan, Midwood, Brooklyn, that house about 300 people, uh, providing them with uh, very comprehensive um, support and, and you know, places to comfortably get off the street and begin to stabilize and begin to connect to services. Um, as part of that, we provide medical and mental health um, services through Danian, also um, provide benefits assistance and help you know, connecting to um, you know, connecting to benefits they're entitled to, connecting to Medicaid, to connecting to pensions, connecting to, to any resources they may have access to but are not receiving, and then you know, help them to transition into permanent housing. Uh, next slide, please. So for outreach, um, we are uh, part of the group of folks who have been given contracts by the Department of Homeless Services, you know, with the goal of um, reducing overall street homelessness, which is measured by the hope count that both Juana and Patricia have spoken about, um, you know, to permanently house uh, chronically street homeless individuals, and also to connect to community and government partners affected by street homelessness. Next, please. So the services we can provide to folks experiencing homelessness um, kind of vary based on how long they have been um, experiencing homelessness. If they are um, you know, short-term homeless, they've just lost their home, they've been staying on the street or couch surfing or, or staying on the subways for a short amount of time, we can connect them to a referral to a shelter or a drop-in center. Um, we do provide street medicine services. We have a, um, a van that goes out um, twice a month to provide uh, medical care, comprehensive medical care to folks on the street. Also, we'll you know, just bring our team out into the street to meet with people. They do a lot of wound care, a lot of diabetes care, a lot of hypertension care. Um, they do COVID testing. We're going to start doing um, testing for hepatitis C and HIV um, and just general harm reduction services around needle exchange and um, you know, teaching people safe use practices and, and the like. We also provide um, psychiatric services to folks who are not chronically homeless, um, providing you know, psychiatric evaluation, connection to treatment and, and whatnot. And then we'll help people connect to public assistance and Medicaid and food stamps. And if they qualify for social security or maybe had social security in the past, we can help them reconnect to those services. Um, next slide, please. For folks that are chronically homeless, meaning they've been homeless for at least nine months out of the last 24 months, we can provide the services on the previous slide, but also a more comprehensive case management. We have um, folks who are um, you know, very well trained. They'll help people kind of start from zero, help them find um, a birth certificate, a marriage license, you know, anything they need to, you know, to gather all the documentation they need in order to apply for housing. Um, they, you know, we work pretty extensively to help people who have immigration issues to you know, get a new green card or to work out um, a way to obtain documentation that they may have lost or that may have expired. We also will refer all of these um, chronically street homeless clients to transitional housing and our safe havens or our stabilization beds and work with them from there to um, you know, get, gain stability and to start kind of down the road to having their own housing. And we also provide very comprehensive benefits assistance through our entitlement specialist who is a brilliant person and knows everything about public assistance and social security and food stamps and, and has you know, a wealth of knowledge. Um, next slide, please. I think for the, the outreach program in Brooklyn, a large part of what I have tried to do as the program director in the last seven years has been to um, really connect with folks in the community. We really do want to work with anyone who is experiencing street homelessness in Brooklyn 
and really want to, um, you know, to uh, connect with everybody that, you know, that might be falling through the cracks. And so we, we reach out to elected officials and community groups and, and especially hospitals are ways to find folks who have been missing, you know, people that have been rotating in and out of EDs, rotating in and out of, of inpatient programs and really need our help. So that is why I'm here today. Uh, thank you all for your time. Okay. Hi, everyone. How are you? My name is Shane Cox. I'm with the uh, Department of Homelessness, the Street Homelessness Solutions Unit. Um, and today I just want to give you um, a fairly broad and general overview of the Street Homeless Solutions Unit. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail around DHS as a whole, um, excuse me, other than to just frame what we do um, in the, via the mission of DHS. So I'll just go through this very quickly. The mission of DHS is to prevent homelessness when possible, to address street homelessness, to provide safe, temporary shelter, and uh, connect homeless New Yorkers experiencing homelessness to uh, sustainable housing, um, and obviously doing so with accountability and empathy. Um, and really what that speaks to is, you know, the conditions of homelessness, obviously, as we all know, vary uh, widely, depending on whether you're talking about an individual or family, an emergency shelter, or transitional housing or on the street. Um, at DHS, we're trying to serve clients at every one of these levels. Um, but, you know, I want to give you a sense more of what we're doing at Street Homeless Solutions in this context. Relatively speaking, we're a new um, and smaller unit, but we're pretty unique in that the work we do, and Casey and Juan are going to speak to a lot of this and have uh, given you some sense of the details, um, but we're connected to people at all of these levels. Um, we're engaging clients really at every step of the pathway out of their homelessness uh, before, during, and after. And the work is probably a bit um, more amorphous and less systematic, um, you know, than some of the other areas in DHS. And we're responding to situations with very high degrees of complexity, um, you know, be it the circumstances that led somebody into homelessness or that sustained it, or just the solutions to getting somebody off the street. Sometimes it's quite difficult to untangle. And um, I, I sense this is not unfamiliar territory uh, to anyone working in a New York City ER. Um, so we sort of mirror that. You're dealing with a lot of complex problems um, that defy single solutions. Um, so I'll go into a little bit of what our work is. Um, and next slide, please. So, um, so you can see at DHS, so what our role, where we see our role really in this uh, process is to bridge the gap um, between all of the systems that our clients touch um, and really working to establish links where there isn't an overlap. What we really want to do is prevent people from falling through the cracks. Um, so we really are trying to facilitate, co uh, facilitate coordination between all these um, agencies, you know, H&H, &H, and as well as many other agencies in the city, be it parks, DSNY, um, DOB, whomever, um, as well as individual hospitals, virtually whomever is dealing with street homeless or individuals who are going to be street homeless or where we really want to be connected to them so we can make sure we're engaging um, and talking to these individuals and ensuring that they have access and availability. Um, and really what we're trying to do with Casey and Juan and the other teams is, you know, our role is really to get anything that works to scale. Um, that's a really big part of what we're trying to do. So. Um, just very briefly, the Street Homeless Solutions Unit, uh, you know, we are 24-7, just like Casey and Wansing, we're a 24-7 unit. Um, we provide an array of services, and I will just kind of uh, go through this very quickly, but really the goal is to design unit, uh, services that are very low barrier, low threshold, and are specialized, um, really for individuals who are living on the street, um, individuals who previously or currently are just unwilling to accept traditional services, such as uh, a New York City shelter. Um, so we kind of see ourselves as the last safety net and our job is to figure out a way to get them off the street. Um, we do this by, you know, we <clears throat> work with nonprofit uh, providers who um, run drop-in centers, safe haven stabilization beds, and just very uh, kind of crudely and briefly, those are housing that is tailored for individuals coming from the street. They're housing that's low threshold, they don't have um, any of the requirements that a normal shelter does. Um, these are services that are designed for street homeless individuals and ways to get them off the street quickly. Um, and then obviously as Casey and Wanish we can do, we also contract out with the street um, 
nonprofit providers to do uh, street and subway outreach. Um, so I guess you can go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry, uh, can go to the next slide, if possible. I don't know if anyone can see it. Okay. So uh, Juan and Casey, again, uh, have been great in uh, speaking to some of the details of their work. Um, again, we contract out the uh, Department of Homeless Services with nonprofit providers to provide 24 hour a day, seven days a week coverage of um, the streets and the subways. And that is through COVID, through Hurricane Sandy, weekends, holidays, whatever the case is, there is always a team in every borough responding to reports of homelessness, trying to identify people who may be homeless, following up on people they know to be homeless, and um, just as Casey and Juan can speak to, just engaging them around coming inside. Everything they do is framed and oriented around housing, trying to get somebody off the street, finding out what the barrier to them coming off the street is, and working, again, in whatever ways to develop solutions that can get them off. And again, there's a pretty complex um, situations and you know they're obviously operating with a very keen understanding that trust is a precondition for all of this work um, as everybody in the healthcare field knows I don't really need to go into a lot of detail but without trust you know you really can't connect to care you can't get somebody inside you can't get somebody to trust you enough to work with you to um, do the things and take down the barriers that we need to to get you inside um, <clears throat> You know, the teams again do this by really bringing the services to the street um, and they are taking whatever time it needs, whatever it takes, however many engagements it takes. Some people it takes years, sometimes it's a little bit quicker, but whatever is needed for them to understand your situation and they bring the services to the street and are engaging you on the street. If that means a psyche valve under a bridge, um, that's what it takes, that's what they're doing. And just showing the, the clients who they're engaging that they are here to stay they're going to be a consistent presence and they are there to help and they will continuously come out to check on people. Um, and again, you know, <clears throat> it's all through getting people back on their feet and trying to get them inside. And really, um, I'll get a little bit into, given that it's the winter now, into the weather protocols and um, code blue. Um, and again, the providers you can see, MOC, uh, the Manhattan Outreach Consortium oversees Manhattan, as Casey said, Breaking Ground oversees Brooklyn and Queens, Bronx Works oversees Bronx, Project Hospitality oversees uh, Staten Island and BRC oversees the subways. Um, and we could just go to the next panel. And just one of the areas where we deal quite a bit with hospitals is code blue. So essentially in these times, uh, these, as we're getting into the winter, when the weather gets below 32 degrees, the outreach teams have a sense of who are the really vulnerable people on the street. Who are the people they are nervous about being out in the weather? Um, and then pretty much what they're doing every night from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. when the weather gets below 32 degrees, and they're obviously checking on these people every other day, but when it gets to below 32 degrees, they're really making um, an effort to get to every one of those people as much as possible throughout the night to engage them, to assess them, and to, again, offer them services and try to get them inside. So, um, again, I, I just want to, given that this is around hospitals, I just want to emphasize that we really see hospitals as being an integral part of this overall process. Um, you know, DHS hospitals, these are all very big, messy systems with different timelines, different imperatives and needs. But, uh, you know, we obviously, there is a pretty, um, there is an overlap between our populations. I, I think it's well understood that, uh, you know, compared with the general population, uh, street homeless individuals, you know, their ER utilization rates are higher than average. And that unfortunately, sometimes emergency departments are the de facto healthcare providers for many of the individuals. So, um, you know, we can get into the factors that contribute to this, um, but we really see that, you know, again, these are, these individuals are bringing extraordinarily complex cases that defy any kind of singular solution. And the only way we are going to help them and get them inside and get them the help they need is if we coordinate and work together. So what we're really trying to do with the hospitals is move from this kind of patchwork system where there's overlap here and overlap here to a more aligned uh, system and much more widespread into integration. And really the nuts and bolts of it, which we'll get into, is going to be a lot, a lot around as Juan was really speaking to coordinating treatment and discharge planning and just ongoing um, communication and consultation around cases. Um, and we can certainly get into what that looks like, the kind of nuts and bolts of it, but uh, it's going to be a lot of a lot of communication, communication, communication. And I know we're all operating under very tight time constraints, so it's a lot of real-time work. Um, so with that, I, I guess we'll be taking questions soon, but thank you.
All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Yinan. I'm one of the primary care doctors at Bellevue Hospital, uh, part of the health and hospital um, system. And um, i really uh, very excited to, to be able to share um, uh, our work as part of the Bellevue Safety Net uh, Clinic today. Um, I hope to kind of give an introduction, but also just to say that um, this is a topic that's obviously very um, sort of a large motivation of why we started this intervention that's based um, within Bellevue and uh, now has this, um, an additional clinic in, in Woodhull as well. Um, so I'll just set up uh, in terms of giving an, an, a brief uh, introduction. Um, so the, the Bellevue Safety Net Clinic um, is uh, an intensive outpatient team um, that uh, kind of focuses specifically on people experiencing uh, various um, levels of homelessness, including street homeless or uh, shelter dwelling. Um, we'll step back uh, for a minute and look at health and hospital, uh, you know, sort of the setting as a whole, as, as Patricia has, um, has mentioned. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we're functioning in a very large health system, one of the largest in the country. Um, and, um, you know, the, some of the demographic data that, that you can see here really mirrors what you've been seeing all day already, right? So there's a uh, very serious racial disparity uh, within the homeless population. Um, you know, the general volume is, is very high that the hospitals see, but in itself, you know, uh, roughly around 700,000 um, people. Um, and then, you know, about 40,000 of that has been marked uh, in our internal database as homeless. Um, and when we zoom in to, you know, I uh, don't think you can see a marker here, but, uh, but to the next graph on, on your right hand side, um, we're seeing that um, these uh, people who are patients who are higher risk, uh, meaning that, you know, they either go through the emergency room a lot, or they have a number of diagnoses, or they, um, uh, have other sort of flag and features that that, um, that make them more, more vulnerable. Um, so when, when the health and hospital data looks at that internally, also not surprising that behavioral health, uh, substance use, and also chronic diseases are sort of the triple morbidity that threatens the population that we're talking about. Um, from the HOPE count data, um, you can see that um, various set settings sees different number of uh, people who are uh, homeless, uh, Bellevue being one of uh, the hospitals on the top, but also Lincoln and, and Harlem. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, currently the cycle, um, which is very familiar to many people, is that um, most people cycle through the acute care, um, which we, you know, which is uh, often appropriate when, when um, there's an acute issue. However, the resources from outpatient care and from other settings are just um, not accessible to a very vulnerable population. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And these are just more sort of um, arrows that are showing that, you know, the main entrance to Bellevue um, versus, uh, you know, the side arrow showing that uh, the clinic setting. All right, so let me just lay it out about uh, our intervention briefly. Um, so um, if a patient gets referred uh, currently, uh, we keep on clicking, I guess, two or three ones down. Per perfect, okay. Um, so if, we, if someone gets um, referred or someone goes to an emergency room, um, you know, a typical patient for us would be, let's say, a, a gentleman in, their, um, in his 50s, which is geriatric for in the um, homeless setting, um, and wheelchair, um, leg wound, many chronic disease, substance use, um, likely a psychiatric diagnosis as well, unable to really navigate to uh, the outpatient world um, ever or rarely. Um, so whenever something comes up, um, then, you know, the only access for medical care um, uh, that, that really can accommodate him is through our acute setting. Um, and uh, what happens is that, you know, often we sort of wait until the patient gets sick enough, gets admitted, um, and then neither side, nor uh, ED nor inpatient, are sort of prepared in a way to handle or address um, the issue of homelessness that kind of um, what brought the patient in to begin with, what was causing this um, admission or visit to begin with. So then we kind of address the patchwork uh, or, you know, do what we can with the medical issues and then send them forward. Um, 
this is this has been sort of the the passive approach and i don't this is a very simplified uh, graph i don't mean to say that there's no intervention that's been tried uh, at both sides there's actually plenty of intervention so health different health homes different hospital um, based interventions such as case management like discharge management ed based high utilizers um, there's a number of intervention that's been done at each site um, However, when we're talking about people who are living on the street with no phone, um, that intervention in itself and limited to a certain site is very limiting. It really requires much more uh, of a bigger web um, to make things progress. Introducing uh, what, what we've been trying to do for the last two years, and we had the luxury to, to really kind of brainstorm and, and, and think about uh, what does it take for the public health, uh, public hospital system to, um, to sort of, um, to, to treat, to take on this problem. Um, so our team is made up of different components. Um, we are made up from different internal department. Um, our nurses and, and doctors are from primary care, or have a financial counselor from the business office. We have social worker care coordinator, outreach coordinator from the, our health home. Um, we have a housing navigator um, who's contracted from CUCS. Uh, and in addition, we also have um, people working from central office that is uh, instrumental in setting up structure and data um, tracking uh, tools for us to really keep track of the patients that are uh, referred to us that we're caring for. Um, and uh, with the goal of um, graduating once they are stabilized in their goals. Um, the next piece that, that you're seeing here is very important. And this is the part that, uh, you know, that, that is very exciting to talk about um, because this is the part that we intersect with so many people that are joined on uh, with us right now. Um, we work very closely with shelter-based case management, street outreach teams, street outreach case management, act team, um, housing providers um, to figure out a good match uh, and figure out, to really figure out how to uh, especially progress in housing, how to um, function in this web of support um, in um, achieving that patient center goal. So, so let's say that that gentleman that I was referring to, um, you know, someone uh, in their 50s, wheelchair, wound, chronic medical issues, psych, substance use, um, gets embraced. We usually will um, orient the patient to say, what, tell us what matters to you. Tell us two or three things that matter to you. And often housing comes up as first uh, item um, or, or second. And then often uh, you'll also hear things like, I want my, I want to be able to walk again. I want to, um, you know, have my uh, pain taken care of, have my wound addressed. I want to, um, you know, have the ability to function to a certain degree. So those are medical uh, goals and housing goals um, that we kind of keep track in our database um, and uh, to see that when, um, you know, when they, they're eventually stabilized and ready to graduate, that we hope to graduate them to um, regular primary care uh, within the hospital or community or shelter-based primary care. Um, so, you know, so that's our setup and that's all nice. And, and you know, I, I know that uh, many people have actually done this sort of collaborative care already um, in the health and hospital, the, in the um, sort of the team clinical model. This is called the complex care model, um, which is not exactly surprising that when you bring people who are from, you know, different area to work together, that our patients get better, right? So this is not exactly surprising, that, which is why we're here, that collaboration actually gets a better. Um, and this also has been done before for many, um, many sort of challenges that public hospital has faced in the past, um, like HIV, Hep C, opioid use disorder, um, the, the, what sets this apart, what, what we're trying to do that I'm hoping to share and also, you know, our challenges and, and get some ideas from everyone, um, is that what we're trying to address is not a diagnosis. It's not something, um, you know, like a heart failure, you know, uh, re-emissions or prevention. Um, we're trying to address poverty and poverty in its very serious level. Um, for someone who is street homeless, and uh, you know our house navigator, um, Ms. K. M. Bowen, was just reminding me this right before the talk, um, that for someone who is street homeless, um, they're really dealing with a very serious level of poverty. Um, that when the surge of homelessness started, uh, you know, it's uh, it's something that the the goal was to eradicate, uh, as she was mentioning. Um, and that was the culture of everyone that was involved in this work. Is that we are we cannot allow this happen. This is um, not acceptable, and how do we solve this problem? 
Um, and then over the years, um, you know, over the years, as I'm sure this, you know, the challenges occur and things come up, the culture has changed to uh, how do we manage it? How do we just make peace with it and, you know, um, sort of maintain this? Um, so this work actually for the past couple of years or past two years um, has reminded us that this is a very solvable problem when we get the right people together and uh, which is what why make this panel so exciting um, but this is a very solvable problem with some real challenges that we can identify the gap when we're all sitting together being transparent and comparing notes to see where exactly the problem lies um, all right so um, i'll move on to the next slide uh, a bit yes thank you um, I was very brief in terms of exactly what um, we are currently doing with street outreach, but there's actually quite a bit going on. Um, so as I mentioned, we're trying to deal with poverty here, right, which is a very um, overarching, uh, ambitious goal. Um, there are a lot of interagency efforts that I just really want to give a shout out to people who are probably on this call from those agencies, um, you know, because, um, because you bring uh, people so I'm talking about street uh, outreach, case management, shelter-based uh, case management, um, ACT teams, uh, housing providers, or anyone who just really um, got invested, got roped into someone um, and, and physically brought the person to us or you know, reach out and allowing us to form this network um, to really progress um, in terms of um, you know, the well-being of a, of a patient. Um, our housing navigator, as I mentioned earlier, um, it also uh, you know, directly does question with street outreach. Um, the second point that I really want to talk about is the internal um, sort of outreach that goes on inside the hospital. When you look at the public hospital system, it's really an extension of the street um, in a way. Um, as you can see, the different sites here, I don't mean to have empty inpatient and clinic, but, uh, and a busy ED, um, but it really is an extension. So how do we reach out from the ED inpatient to clinic in a functional loop. Um, and we've been trying to do that, currently we're doing that through warm handoffs and being proactive about you know, inpatient discharges coming straight to us with the patient physically walking to us. There's ED utilizers that we're talking with and utilizing their skills in terms of warm handoff as much as possible. But I know some of the big questions that's gonna come up, which is, um, a lot of issues revolving you know, like inappropriate discharges, you know, a lot of agencies dealing with that. Um, I would love to share some perspectives um, on that. Um, and the very last thing that, that I'll say, and I hope to be able to address maybe a little bit more in the Q&A session, um, is what captures how this happened within the public hospital system. Um, this happened really through a web of frontline leaders, and I don't mean leaders by titles, it's actually leaders, um, the people that are leading our team, I would say, are people who are um, in their department, um, but you know, they basically had to make a choice in saying um, that put placing their human value first before what's been in the past. So for any one situation, you know, the question is constantly, what can I do for this person in front of me rather than what, you know, what, what's usually done, you know, what, what, what I was told to do. Um, that connection along with everyone else um, in the community who also is willing to push beyond their role just a little bit, um, that allows us to form this net in, in terms of actually um, engaging someone effectively. Um, I'll wrap up there and I'm you know, looking forward to discussing more in the Q&A section. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, you can definitely see why you guys were chosen for this panel. You guys all have done great work and are very passionate about both healthcare and homelessness. So thank you. We have quite a bit of questions, um, great questions actually. So I'm excited to, to do the Q&A. Um, but first, one question I have, you know, as I started my piece of the presentation, I really talked about racial disparities. I think it's important to ground our work and the disparities we're seeing and how we're using information to kind of inform our programs. And we know that, you know, we've all in kind of the field know that there's these disparities, but more recently have been starting to gather that data and analyze it. So, you know, just a question for, for, the, uh, for all the panelists here. What are the racial and ethnic disparities 
communities are seeing with the people you serve? And what are some opportunities for you to collect this data to inform your program? Um, I think you know, we, we definitely are aware of the racial disparities. If you just look at our, our plain straight up data, you know, people of color are much more likely to um, experience street homelessness than else. The majority of our clients are men of color, a lot of them with incarceration histories and uh, foster care histories and, and just um, histories of you know, systemic involvement in, in, in systems that are oppressive to, to folks. And so I think we're always looking at at the ways to mitigate that oppression and to, to kind of try and level the playing field as much as we can and, and focus our energies on um, you know, anti-racist policies and on uh, kind of undoing what we can um, and moving people forward. I don't know if that answers your question, but, <laughs> but it's definitely something that we, we look at and, and are very cognizant of. Anyone else want to add? Great. I mean, I think the, the disparities mm -hmm. we see, you know, do reflect um, some of the inequities in society. And then really what we're trying to do is just, you know, um, we can sort of work upstream. There's definitely a way to work upstream to prevent people from being homeless in the first place. And I think uh, what Casey and Juan and everyone can speak to is what we're really trying to do is just change the way we offer housing and really get people inside first to kind of address those disparities as soon as possible when people come on the street and then kind of slowly work backwards from there. Thank you. So the question, so if I'm a homeless service provider and I wanted to start to build a better relationship with my local hospital, where do I start? And uh, maybe if we can hear from Huang, because you know, you guys have been doing this and have set up this model. So what are the key right. steps uh, to begin this process? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I guess just, you know, from experience, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's nothing like like sort of the, you know, rolling up your sleeves and just kind of going in and introducing yourself to folks. I think that's how a lot of our work has gotten started. You know, we, we just kind of go in and, and really make an effort to, you know, we, we know clients are in the EDs, we know they're in the waiting areas, but it's not just about, you know, engaging the clients. You also want to make sure the staff um, is engaged and that they understand what services you provide um, and, and get information from them. You know, they may be seeing things that um, are are important for you to know as a team. Um, and then I think kind of working your way up from there. I mean, you know, folks above, you know, above my level, kind of engaging with folks at the hospital on the administrative side um, and really kind of digging into, you know, um, you know, what's the workflow, what's going on, what, what are the, um, what, what, what's the culture? Like, for example, I could think of a hospital um, that, you know, for years has had issues with folks sleeping in the ED and, um, and you know, once we had these high level meetings, we, we started to find out all these things about, you know, how they treated folks when they came into the ED. They, they were giving them sandwiches and then put it on the stretcher and metro cards and et cetera, et cetera, and all this stuff. And it was like the red carpet treatment. Um, and they weren't, re like the staff wasn't necessarily addressing the fact that they were homeless. They were, they were kind of setting up uh, like, you know, like an overnight stay <laughs> at the hospital. Um, and that, you know, that was a big deal for us to find out because then, you know, it was like, all right, well, this is making it difficult for us in, in terms of, you know, the work we're trying to do. So maybe we can try to figure out a way for you guys to scale back a little bit and then we can come in and offer another option. Um, so it's a lot of like on the ground work to, to try to answer your question. You know, um, it's really sort of the the day-to-day the -day contact with people um, and then kind of, you know, working from the top to figure out what the culture is and what, what the workflow is and where, um, how is homelessness viewed in that particular hospital, in that ED? Um, are they treating it? Are they, um, are they just making assumptions? Are they bypassing it? Are they just kicking it to social work? Um, you know, are they punting it? You know, is it a, a dump job? You know, just send that person to Bronx work, send this person here. Um, all that stuff is important to find out. So you can kind of fill in, fill in the gaps. Thank you. That's really helpful. And, you know, it makes me think of kind of reversely, right, on the healthcare mm -hmm. side, Dr. Lan, what, you know, how do you start developing these partnerships? What are some steps that you, you know, you, that you need to take and that would be helpful to share with the audience? Absolutely. Um, so, yes. So I was thinking about what Juan said. Um, 
so on two levels, I think people who work for the public hospital or any hospital system, um, there was a mission, a personal mission that, that usually got them there to, in the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, somewhere along the way, the structure doesn't really support that. And so then you end up doing what you can or um, get absorbed into various cultures um, at work and, um, you know, and uh, various results. Um, for, from us, from our perspective, so we can share about, a little bit about how things started here, um, but for any organization that wants to work with a hospital that, you know, may not have a team and is just kind of thinking about how to approach, um, we kind of really try to understand the different settings in terms of what are they dealing with? What does it look like to, um, how does a workflow look like in the ED, in the inpatient setting? Um, and then that sheds a lot of light because in the emergency room, when you have teams that, you know, and Dr. Doran can, can speak more to this, um, we have teams that are managing trauma and chest pain and whatnot, you know, there's not going to be that focus um, or the resources really to, um, to uh, offer to someone who is dealing with homelessness. Um, that is one piece of it. Um, and then sort of the other thing is, um, coming together to actually take a look at what is there already. There are some things that the hospital can do well because there are some resources laid in place. Um, and there are some things that, that we really do not do very well. Housing, for example, and I don't think, you know, is a very um, fundamental knowledge to a lot of our providers, a lot of our frontline uh, people in the ED and inpatient. Um, but we kind of sit together and, and really being transparent and look at the gaps um, that, that we have in terms of what we can do and cannot do. That's when um, it becomes more clear, like organizations like Bronx Work and others, um, Breaking Ground and, and whatnot, where do um, what, what you do well like fit into the hospital. Um, so for us, it's certainly there's a lot of uh, silo breaking. And, and I think that was, I was touching on, on that in my, my last point. Um, the hardest part of um, this, you know, from the surface, it looks like great. You got some, you know, resources together. You know, this is, um, you know, nice um, setup. Um, but then the constant fight that we go through, uh, constant struggle that we go through, um, is really kind of um, setting up a new norm um, in terms of what it is that we're actually doing. And the question that that, that we constantly strive is that how do we do this within our limit? How do we think outside? How do we actually lead this work? Um, often contradicting what the culture of what our traditional role has been. Um, so our, you know, clinic nurse, PCPs, care coordinators, uh, social work, uh, you know, um, finance person, they don't do what a traditional person would do in their role. Um, and that sometimes can be costly. And uh, yeah, so I think um, going a little bit above though, when, when you see solution for that, when you have people that are willing to, to lead the way um, in that, that um, really changes the game. Thank you. And I think, you know, one of the things that automatically comes up in my head and a lot of questions directed towards this is the sustainability of these partnerships, right? So in particular, we got a question, um, you know, the Bronx Works uh, example is an excellent one for the benefits of hospital social service organization partnership. But the funding um, of these sorts of partnerships is really at risk. And Huang talked about how a lot of these programs, or a lot of these positions were eliminated because district was eliminated. So um, how do we start to think about new paths to start sustaining this? Uh, somebody mentioned um, in, in the Q&A, you know, what, how are we looking at Medicaid managed care payers to do this? What does the ROI look like? You know, what, are there, do you have any thoughts about um, this particular challenge and how you're starting to move towards getting the sustainable funding for this type of work? It's kind of open to anyone. I mean, even, even Shane, if you can yeah, think about I mean, your, your part of this too. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm thinking of it in a, in a bit of a different way. I mean, I can speak less to the funding. I mean, I think what we're looking to do is just really integrate a bit more, certainly on the day-to-day -day level with the hospitals and thinking through if, you know, setting aside if that funding isn't there and we cannot sustain the kind of those programs, how do we make it in the kind of routine course of business in an ER or through the hospital that there is a direct kind of pathway to um, the outreach teams and to DHS in general via, you know, a kind of single point of access, single numbers, who to call, when, and just really trying to establish that um, via protocols and processes and, um, you know, just, it's their big systems and just whatever ways we can integrate that, um, you know, 
Casey and Juan mentioned, we have a lot of situations, I'm sure, throughout the five boroughs where, where case managers and social workers have very good relationships. Maybe a doctor who's very familiar with this team, but overall, we want to get to a point where you know, every social worker or every doctor or whomever is in the hospital knows that this is the way to get in touch with the homelessness system. And we can try to provide a pathway there um, in the absence of there being someone from DHS at one of these hospitals. And that, that pathway would then lead to some kind of assessment to say this client is really, this is a, you know, a shelter referral, or this is somebody for the street outreach team, or we know them, or let's work on discharge planning, or whatever the case is, and kind of triaging these things in real time, I think is the place we want to get to, um, with the hospitals. And that's what we're trying to do. So I think systematically working through it that way, um, which it doesn't exactly address the funding, but it's it just sort of the, the bigger picture is what we're trying to get to, in addition to these uh, teams being at the hospitals. That's helpful. And maybe, Dr. Lan, if you can talk about kind of from the hospital side, like what does it take for them to invest in this, right? What, you know, what, what would you have to share with the audience in order to get a program like this um, running? So a program like this has existed in the past and come and gone um, because the funding ran out. Um, so we, when we structured it, we did not want it to be um, funding a dependent um, especially especially a um, temporary funding. Um, so this is structured, this is a restructure really of part of primary care, uh, the world that I kind of belong to at the time. And then slowly diving into a slight restructure of other parts of the organization. Um, in that, you know, I think when you, when you sit down with a, if you're at the level of sitting down with a high level, um, uh, you know, organization and then asking them to restructure is a very big uh, ask, obviously. But if we're saying that, how about that we just try it for a small group of people? How about we just try it with one person? That's a lot more feasible um, ask. Um, you know, I think everyone would agree. Everyone would be on the same page when we say that clearly this is not working, right? Like you see it, the hospital see it, the street outreach see it, everyone sees it. Um, how do we um, allow that flexibility to to uh, work out a solution? Um, so what we kind of try to do and still try to do um, is to um, ask for more local buy-ins um, in terms of um, you know no major restructures, but um, you know, asking for really reorganizations of what's already happening, uh, but in a way that makes sense. Um, internally to the hospital, many of our organizations um, previously, you know, obviously working in silo and it gets very frustrated. No one can reach a doctor, the doctors can, you know, reach the nurse and then, you know, the, no one can reach each other. Um, so I think just having that luxury of um, really, I think that's a resource that was invested uh, in us. It's not really any physical, uh, you know, any, anyone that says, here's a bunch of money here, you know, go nuts. Um, but really it was just, people saying that here, like, I'm gonna give you some space to see if you can, you guys can come up with a solution to this. Um, and that's a very, very feasible act. And once that they are, people are seeing that, that this is feasible, this is actually working, um, then the ideas start to spark a little bit more, then maybe we can add one more. Maybe we could do that at another site. Um, maybe we should have a conversation about it in another hospital, um, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, to the person's comment, managed care has to be at the table right? It's, it's their members <clears throat> that are incurring these costs, right? So how do we start to really, when we talk about partnerships and integration with healthcare, managed care has to be at the table because I think they have a lot to learn and they're starting to. So hopefully there's managed care organizations on this that are listening to this and want to start looking at their data and their cost savings. I know at CSH we've done with in partnership with a lot of people probably on this call, a lot of like work in looking at data and outcomes and cost savings. So, you know, I would say that's probably one thing that needs to continue to be um, talked about. <clears throat> Anybody else want to add anything around the sustainability and funding aspects of it? So there's a couple of questions here, um, really just from a hospital perspective on you know, how to navigate the system. Um, so for example, you know, some person mentioned that the emergency at the emergency department, they're seeing more and more people who are experiencing street homeless, um, who are also very sick, um, so medically sick. Uh, they don't wanna go to the intake shelter, 
given whatever reasons of experiences they've had, um, people want to know what are the options they have for people who particularly don't meet the criteria for chronic homelessness. And I'll open up to the panel, but I also know we have um, some of our colleagues from the hospital who started a program all around housing at risk that, you know, we hear from them as well, but I'll start it off with the panelists first. What are the options if people don't want to go to shelter? Um, in my experience, there's always a bit of flexibility. You know, we, as time has gone by, our programs, they really, at the beginning, were very, very focused on only working with chronically street homeless individuals, people that, that were not, you know, utilizing any other systems. And as time has gone by, we've kind of caught all those people, or most of those people, and so have more flexibility to work with folks who may be not chronically street homeless, but, you know, we can kind of see the signs. We know that they are... Uh, very, very resistant to going into shelter. We know that the reason they became or started to experience homelessness was um, in, you know, something that is not going away, something that is persistent and not um, necessarily going to be alleviated by you know, time or money or whatever else. Um, and we can then you know, take the initiative to kind of expedite them into our, our more comprehensive programs. And that's something that DHS has done with the stabilization bed programs is that those, are, those do not require um, Next street homelessness, and most of them are you know, just a bed, but like my program in Williamsburg is more comprehensive. We have case management on site and meals, and so um, are able to take folks who maybe not chronically street homeless, but are in need of, of that level of service. Yeah, as Casey was saying, yeah, we've been really in the teams. I think the best thing to do would be connect them to a team. I mean, that's the first step, and then the team can really, every case is different, but really assess within the whole spectrum of housing and available options what, how we need to get them inside. I mean, I think as Casey's saying, we're, we've been working in a, in a bit of a different way. We've expanded our stabilization beds and safe havens and there's always flexibility and we're always trying to find appropriate fits. And I think what the teams are doing is, the end goal is housing and in real time, in the, in the time in, you know, where, how can we get that person into housing as soon as possible? And what is available across the spectrum and where can we put them in and what, what what rules um, you know guide that or are changing and we're just we're just trying to put people inside as soon as possible and using whatever we have at our fingertips drop-ins safe havens whatever the case is right yeah I would I would just yeah, I would concur with everybody I mean basically we've been we've been able to be more creative um, in the past you know if you had someone um, at a hospital that had maybe some complicated medical issues we really would would sort of come to a dead end um, and if they didn't meet certain criteria um, but now, you know, we can sort of be a little more creative and, and use more resources to, to address that person's homelessness, um, for sure. So, you know, uh, from a team perspective, it's, it's definitely helpful to have those options now. Yeah. And, you know, just to put a plug in there, there's some particularly supportive housing units that don't require the chronic homeless chronicity, right? So I think, you know, if you're even a hospital setting, I know when I worked in the hospital, I often did 2010s um, to get people into supportive housing. And, you know, sometimes it works, it takes a long time, but sometimes there the way the system has changed throughout the couple last couple of years um, is, is enabling people to determine whether people um, are eligible to support housing and what kind of supportive housing. So that's always an option if you have some, if you have the time and the ability to do that as well. But I agree with the team here. It's important for you to have that relationship and reach out right away because they have creative ways. Um, they have creative ways uh, in order to engage folks. And I know I mentioned, you know, we have, um, you know, there's a really great program at Montefiore and kind of gets at the partnership it also gets at the sustainability and investment um, is the Montefiore's Housing at Risk program that really kind of works to identify needs in the hospital and connects directly with providers. And I'm wondering if, um, oh, and Deirdre just put in the comment if, if Kiana or Deirdre can talk a little bit about how they've done this and also how did they obtain the funding for this and what are their, some of their plans to continue to expand this work? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kiana Serrano. I'm the project manager for the Housing at Risk program at Montefiore Hospital. Um, and we really feel very fortunate to be able to provide um, this level of housing intervention built into our hospital system. Um, our program originated out of our care management um, sector in 2009. So we've been doing this work for 11 years. Um, and it really came out of grassroots organizations um, 
through the hospital uh, administration, really recognizing the role that housing plays in the social determinants of health. Um, and, and the hospital currently pri like basically pays out of the social work budget to fund our program. We're a really small team. Um, it's myself and another social worker. We currently have some interns through NYU, but we are really uh, advocating to increase the funding, especially in light of COVID. Um, there are so many families that are being driven to homelessness because they don't have future ability to pay for their rent or um, also just with COVID folks. Uh, I mean, the, the street homeless population has been really vulnerable. You know, we're really trying to cut down on homeless folks being in the ED um, just to reduce their risk of COVID transmission. So we're really partnering with Bronx Works a lot to um, try to come up with interventions for these folks. Um, one of the main things though that we've, we've really invested in is the communal life respite program where the hospital private pays for um, four beds. And, and we really try to target folks that are admitted inpatient, that um, they're stable, they're medically stable for discharge, but they don't have anywhere to discharge to, and they're not appropriate for shelter due to their condition or the treatment that they need. So we've been able to triage them to the communal life respite program where they can stay, ideally for up to 90 days until they're stable and they have a secure uh, discharge plan. And this has really helped um, in a couple of ways. One, we're able, because they're medically uh, cleared for discharge, we're able to get them into communal life so that we can free that bed up for another patient that needs that space. Um, so that is really helpful. And, and really, we find that through putting them in communal life, we are reducing their chances of readmission and really trying to break that cycle of continuing to readmit and come back into the ED because of their chronic medical condition. So it's really been helpful twofold in saving the hospital money. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has any other specific questions I can speak on. Thanks, Kiana. That's really helpful. And I know you have uh, Deirdre on as well, um, uh, who, who works with you on this program. And it'd be interesting to know, you know, as Rachel Pine in the chat mentioned, you know, commitment can bring MCOs and other systems to the table, but really a return on investment in terms of money is what gets people to commit and do contractual relationships. And Deirdre, I'm wondering if you can speak to kind of Montefiore's experience in setting up these, uh, this investment and what, you know, what the return investment looked like for the hospital in order for them to say, yes, we're going to fund this program. Sure. Hi, everybody. It's Deirdre. Um, so it's shown the return on investment for our respite beds is pretty clear because we have a formula that we can show if we can discharge somebody as soon as they're medically ready and not have them linger in the hospital and place them in respite, there's a cost savings immediately there. There's also um, potential revenue um, in the respite beds because you're freeing up a bed so that somebody else who's waiting in the emergency room who really needs care can come in and take that bed. Um, with the housing at risk program, we were able to show when we looked at like interventions in the emergency room, preventing unnecessary um, admissions into the hospital just due to social issues like homelessness or reducing the length of stay, we were able to show cost, state, cost savings to the hospitals that way also. Great, thank you. And I know, you know, a lot of questions are coming in around, again, funding and sustainability. And I'm wondering, um, Shane, is there, you know, uh, it's, it's very hard for small organizations to kind of advocate um, on getting these partnerships done or any investments. Is there anything that DHS, do you think, um, can, can do to pursue these conversations and start to really form that dialogue? Yeah, I mean, I think it will come out of our relationships with the hospitals. And as we work more and more and get a better sense of trends and what people are seeing and what the needs are and being able to quantify it probably and and work a little more closely um, to address very specific problems. I think that's part of the facilitation role we'll have, and we can certainly work around that with the hospitals. I think that's, that's definitely something that should come up. Because again, 
there's a need for us to be working more closely. And I think as we work more closely, a lot of things and the new approaches are gonna come through and some of the old approaches are working that we can look into, definitely. Right. And, um, you know, another question came here. Actually, uh, somebody mentioned, Shane mentioned that there's no singular solution. And I think many on this webinar would agree that permanent housing is the single singular solution. But in the interim, it seems that safe haven and the hotel stabilization beds have had much more uptake than intake shelter referrals. How do we rapidly expand options that people want and ultimately connections with permanent housing? Does anybody want to add on to that piece? I think it's a really good question especially as we're entering as especially as we're in this world of covid um things have to look a little different and i know we're going to have a panel later on around the hotel isolation but anything anybody wants to add here or shane anything you want to add from a dhs perspective um yeah i mean we we certainly have been pushing for an expansion of the beds and what we want and you know the singular solution is more around obviously i think agree that permanent housing is absolutely a solution. I'm, I'm more talking about getting somebody off the street and into the housing is, is kind of what we're seeing. When we engage somebody who uh, does not want to come inside or is reluctant to engage us or has a very complicated set of issues and um, we're having a difficult time um, you know, breaking through with that individual. I think we would absolutely, we really appreciate the expansion of the stabilization beds and the safe havens and those are just more tools for the teams to have a wider array of tools. Um, obviously, as Casey said, there's a wide range. There's different stabilization beds, different safe havens with um, kind of different focuses and giving the teams the ability to use those uh, more rapidly and in real time, I think is what we want to, we're aiming for. And so I, I would, yeah, I think we'd certainly welcome an increase. And as we can show that this is really effective way of getting people off the street in very, um, in shorter time, you know, as soon as they're ready to come off the street, we get them inside is what we want to prove and show so we can expand them. Yeah, and we have another another great question here, scenario, and maybe uh, Dr. Lan, I'm sure you probably have experienced this and maybe you can add some insight. So a couple of months ago, I spoke to a 76 year old woman living in the park, a couple of blocks from Lincoln Hospital. She was clearly psychotic with severely infected legs that had been recently bandaged by a professional. She had over 2,000 contacts with an outreach team. She was obviously confused and incapable of appropriately caring for herself. The hospital that changed the bandage and treated her legs ignored her profound mental illness, a common phenomenon. Even though she was street homeless, there was no discharge coordination with our outreach team. What can be done to prevent these sorts of situations? Yes. Um... That is a very um, sort of common scenario that, that we see and um, very, um, yeah, very, very disheartening. Um, so there's a couple incidents I, I will just focus on, I think, um, two angles of this. Um, not to underestimate engagement by somebody uh, in that we really don't know um, which group or which person that person may build relationship with. Um, so, you know, I think there are certainly uh, people that are supposed to be doing engagement or assigned to, um, but I think there are also people that, um, you know, uh, other people in different roles that may actually achieve a successful engagement with that person. Um, so um, sometimes often what, what we do is that we would um, check on people, uh, you know, this is more often pre-COVID that people who are hanging around very regularly in the lobby and whatnot, um, just to see that, you know, with that consistency outreach, who that person might actually engage with. Um, and then we kind of uh, sort of attempt to build a gradual relationship and we get a lot of contacts from people who are not in the medical field or homeless field or, um, or anywhere, just really concerned citizens who have been engaging uh, and building relationship with someone um, that's been living on the street for a long time and um, going pretty extensive distance to really trying to see what can be done for an individual person. Um, I think that is such key uh, in, in some ways, not to put the, you know, the burden on um, uh, everyone, but in a way it's also, you know, echoing what Shane said in that no single solution. Um, it really is everybody uh, sort of an effort. Um, on the hospital and with mental health, that's a very uh, challenging question. But when we kind of lay it out, um, you know, first of all, this whole thing looks like a big jumbo challenge that, that when anyone look at it from hospital end or whichever end, we tend to say, this is a hopeless situation. We're just gonna do what we can, like give the bandage and move on. Um, but when we like kind of, you know, um, dissect it a bit more, um, the couple issues may come up. Um, one thing that, that you know, we, we can get to know in, 
exactly what kind of resources are available in the ED level and perhaps the person gets admitted, it gets admitted very frequently before. Um, and then what exactly happens that led to the cycle to restart itself? Um, so oftentimes, you know, if um, psychiatry and whatnot is involved, um, you know, when we get down to the nitty gritty of it, we may identify the source being that there simply is not enough bed for people who are, you know, mentally sick enough um, to stay in the hospital. And that being the um, missing gap link here. So if we identify that, we could actually, that's good that we can actually, you know, then pull our resources to focus on that, to say that is, that is the most common reason why people get turned away. Um, so, um, so that allows us to at least unite our, our limited resources and, and, you know, address something. But for various uh, other um, people that it may be something else. It may be, you know, that, that the only option for them is a nursing home because their legs are not, you know, are not able to, uh, they can't do uh, activity daily, daily living, they can't ambulate well enough, but the nursing home options are really not great. So then they circle back on to the street because they rather have their independence. So I think dissecting out exactly what the problem is um, allows us to, to narrow in on each individual case and then allows us to build data on exactly the larger gap that we're talking about here. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, kind of Amy Freeman in the chat said exactly what I was thinking. We need to coordinate data systems better so we can communicate with each other. And anybody who knows me knows I'm obsessed with leveraging data <laughs> to inform work. So I think that's a key, a key piece. And um, I wonder how, um, you know, Shane, have you been in touch with like Greater New York Hospital? as DHS like to really start to facilitate these connections or maybe that's a, another step that you guys would take it, it's probably another step I myself I know there's probably conversations going on and again between D, uh, DHS and them um, not so much on the street outreach side but it, it is maybe a step to look into I mean certainly I mean but again yeah obviously integrated in what, as many ways as possible mm -hmm. aligning integration definitely speaking to each other and you know, real time is really the key and absolutely whatever we can do to move that along is definitely helpful. That is always, you know, a, a great way to drive the work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we only have a couple of minutes, but, you know, we, we have to talk about COVID because um, what kind of panel would this be if we don't talk about COVID a little bit? Um, so, you know, in light of COVID, what is the, what's the role that hospitals will play during code blue? Have you guys experienced any changes there or anything you can share around what's happening in the emergency rooms around Code Blue or in the hospital in general? This is kind of to, to everyone. I can speak to it very briefly. I mean, I know given the um, situation with COVID, obviously ERs are not the best place for very vulnerable individuals to be. And so what we've been trying to do is we're working with the hospitals in real time. Every Code Blue, we're calling all the AODs at the H&H &H hospitals at least and asking them what the situation is, who's there, what's going on, and trying to triage in real time, um, figure out a solution. Are they willing to come inside? Can we figure out a way to get them there and trying to deal with it um, then? And that's, that's kind of the key thing we're doing right now. Anybody else want to add or, or add just in general, how has COVID, you know, it's presented lots of challenges, but it also has presented some opportunities. Um, so how has, you know, how are things different now in the COVID world that you guys want to share as around any challenges or opportunities that you guys identified in your work? I mean, the stabilization bed programs that we have access to now did open due to COVID and trying to um, provide more physical space for folks and shelters. So that has definitely been something we're utilizing and hoping that we'll continue past this crisis. Um, you know, in my experience, especially in the early, early days of COVID, a lot of folks were very reluctant to come indoors because they were afraid of being in an enclosed space and, you know, and, and we're not so trusting of our efforts to make sure that it was you know, clean and that people who were experiencing symptoms were, were being isolated and everything. But I feel like as time has gone by, people have become a little more um, trusting and, and a little more open to coming indoors, but it's, I think that will continue to be a challenge, especially for our folks experiencing mental illness that comes with you know, paranoia and delusions and, and that sort of thing that, that sometimes make them um, reluctant to accept services from government entities or what have you. Um, it's, yeah, a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody 
feels the same way on this, but at, you know, we're at time now. So I just wanted to really thank you all for uh, sharing your work and sharing your thoughts. And thank you to everybody who um, is in attendance today for their wonderful questions and comments. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this panel and, you know, thank you everybody.